My name is Field Garthwaite. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Iris TV. We're going to talk about some use cases, how we're using machine learning in some live production environments, and, and how uh, USA Today and Gannett uh, use this uh, around the Olympics and some kind of great applications of uh, AI and use cases around video programming. Um, I'm here with Kara Childs, uh, who is a senior product manager at USA Today and Gannett. And she has an amazing background in, in media and content, um, ranging from being a reporter to a product strategist and a number of great companies, including WebMD and AOL and, and even Whole Foods, and, uh, and then USA Today for many years. So a uh, little bit of background. Um, we're going to really focus on how publishers can regain control of audiences. Um, this is like a topic that's particularly interesting for uh, many publishers today in terms of how they can utilize social media and kind of marketing channels to grow their audiences. So we're going to focus on video and how AI and machine learning can be used to really drive contextually relevant programming to audiences and even leverage breaking and kind of day-to-day -day content to people whom it's relevant to when you have a high load of content being distributed and published. Um, and Iris TV has background. We're a personalization and programming platform. Uh, we'll show a quick video on us. And uh, the work that we did with Gannett uh, was very focused on creating a better user experience and then deriving data and insight that would be actionable to a number of different teams across the organization. So this includes editorial, uh, product, uh, revenue teams, and management. And so with that, um, Kara is going to be talking about how uh, they utilize our platform around the um, Olympics specifically. And it's a great resource to have her here because it's a really exciting use case. Um, I learned more about it talking with her, and so this will be a lot of fun. And um, just handing it off to Kara, I'm going to brag a little bit about them. Uh, they just won three Pulitzers in the last year, and so uh, we know this is a topic everyone is, is you know, kind of thinking about when it comes to fake news or false information. And really, this is the, the companies that are investing in media and journalism and factual information. And so uh, it's great to see them seeing you know, great success. Well, thank you very much. And it's great to be here today. Thank you for uh, you know, recaffeinating after lunch and joining us this afternoon. Yeah, we so, won't be boring. We'll move fast. That's right. Um, so one of the things we'll talk about though as well, and it's particularly germane for this group, is a lot of people when they hear video they're thinking about what they're watching and not just the platform that it's sitting on. Uh, this group obviously is a little bit different and part of where we're taking the product strategy for USA Today Network and the 108 local market sites that we support as well as the USA Today flagship is really around thinking about product life cycle as well as that product experience to meet a lot of different users at a lot of different communities and levels in a viewing experience context. So for us, part of what that involved was rolling out an enterprise-wide proprietary player that would allow us to distribute video across all of these different markets, some to very small, like a Fort Collins, Colorado, to a very large, like the Arizona Central in Phoenix. Um, we're equally looking at solutions right now, and we're all um, in the media space feeling the challenge of the changing browser environment. And so really looking at ways that we can break loose from an autoplay with sound on default experience that we know is not a customer favorite uh, to other ways that we can use that experience to both capture and retain users as well as satisfy advertisers. And then we're also looking at ways that we're going to continue to grow just as everyone else is experiencing um, mobile web as a, as a primary part of our viewership and our video experience across the board. So in terms of that, what that means for us in terms of programming and personalization, what we're doing right now is we're moving from a very desktop intensive, plug it in, promote it across the network footprint to one that is really moving in the direction of test and learn. Uh, while this is something that a lot of product management organizations embrace, it's still, I would say, in its very early stages at USA Today Network because part of what we're looking at is really using this extended uh, market audience that we have to do a lot of different types of testing. And it's teaching us more about our video network and, and how best to adapt that product experience based on those markets and those appetites. As part of that as well, we're really looking at how do we actually take this and create new revenue streams? How do we actually use franchises uh, both from a content perspective and a day parting or week parting perspective to create different ways to approach content and get it in front of audiences in the right time and place? And then, um, as I mentioned, using those audiences, one of the things that we see is the ability to recognize that 
We went from a waterfall model where what we delivered and developed for USA Today was really sort of trickled down to the rest of the markets to recognizing that local markets and audiences have overlapping but also distinctly different needs and interests. So as we develop our video product capabilities, how are we thinking about some of those unique aspects? So this is just a quick video and background on our product and uh, provide a little background so I don't have to talk about it. Online video is the fastest growing form of media, but the majority of video views are on social media where there are poor unit economics and you lose control of your audience. Iris TV is a video personalization and programming platform that helps you achieve the reach and scale of social media on your owned and operated sites and apps. Hundreds of broadcasters and publishers worldwide use Iris TV to maximize revenue and yield from streaming. The platform is composed of three core systems. First, we ingest and analyze your content feed using Asset IQ to assess the health of your asset metadata. Healthy metadata is critical to maximizing user engagement through personalization. Asset IQ utilizes AI and machine learning to enrich metadata and create structured taxonomies for digital assets on an initial and ongoing basis. Next, we integrate our personalization engine, Adaptive Stream, directly to your video player. Adaptive Stream uses machine learning to create dynamic playlists, personalized to each user by taking into account a variety of factors, such as context, individual behavior, device, location, time of day, as well as behavioral segmentation. Prior to Iris TV, you'd have one playlist for millions of viewers. Now you have millions of playlists for millions of viewers. This enables you to surface the breadth of your library at scale. For short form ad supported video, more views equals more sellable ad inventory. For OTT and SVOD, Iris TV can surface recommendations to maximize subscriber yield. Through our programming management and analytics dashboard, Iris Vision, you can control programming according to editorial and business rules. Clients can also run smart branded video campaigns in stream, turning every video player into a potential entry point for branded content. In addition, clients are able to gather business intelligence on user behavior and video asset performance across a variety of parameters to inform content creation, distribution, and monetization. With the Iris TV video programming platform, you will maximize stream yield and revenue potential of every viewer. The future of TV is about your brand, your audience, and keeping them engaged. Iris TV, keep watching. So Gannett is really a great use case of this. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly cover kind of the high level with regards to how uh, we are implementing machine learning in production environments. So uh, the first is creating a common data model. So this is something that, um, for example, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Netflix, are very good at doing this, um, but kind of traditional media companies have been a little bit slow to adopt. The second component, which the video uh, touched on, is how our APIs implement into video players to actually capture audience behavior. Um, something we'll touch on briefly is how we do that in a GDPR compliant way, um, which is a very relevant topic for those of you uh, dealing with it right now. And um, lastly, uh, you know, how you essentially de develop insight and kind of get it to teams in an actionable way. So uh, the first um, component here we're going to talk about is metadata ingestion and taxonomy creation. Uh, and then we'll kind of move through those other steps. The uh, major takeaway here in terms of creating a common data model is every business is unique. So if you're a broadcaster, a news publisher, you may have some common ground with other news publishers and best practices you can adopt. But you're also going to have like topics like sections of your paper or areas that you have specific coverage. Um, so there's a number of examples that Kara will talk about, um, but one is like the Olympics, right, or other kind of special series. And having a taxonomy and common data model around that makes the, the data model machine learning uh, manipulable in the future, so you can actually structure business rules around it. Uh, the second piece, the API integration, this is uh, fairly straightforward, like most APIs, but IRSDB kind of sits on top of any player. Um, in uh, this use case, um, this is kind of a bright code backend, um, and uh, Iris TV is also able to implement uh, API installation. So if you have your own video player um, as uh, Gannett does now, then uh, it's also kind of easy to integrate. And finally, um, in terms of how this personalizes video, a little bit of background. 
setting up instruction, creating uh, using NLP to create that contextual kind of relevant data on an asset level, uh, sets up the first kind of machine learning system, as well as what device, time of day, other contextual information, and find, finally, like cohort analysis. So those three uh, kind of sit under a business rules engine that allow an editorial team or product team like Gannett and USA Today to essentially then control the machine learning. And uh, Kara is going to tell you more about how they used it in specific instances. That's right. So with this in mind, I think one of the things that we were trying to set up here was really to be able to take advantage of um, what we saw. There we go. Um, as a major content product and advertising opportunity. So with an event like the Olympics, one of the things we see is that it's an international story, obviously. It has a national level story arc as well as one that could be individual to specific markets where, say, athletes may be from or where there is a training center. Um, and with all of those stories, we also know that sports is a uniquely highly engaged category. And it also, this event in particular, <laughs> draws in a lot of people who may not identify as sports junkies. So we really saw a lot of opportunity here to reach people who are highly engaged and very loyal, uh, very casual, may not even be regular users of the site, but would definitely come in for the experience and a lot of original content that would be getting created. And then advertisers really trying to reach that heightened volume around this, this global and centralizing event. Out of this then, there was a lot of coordinating complexity. And this is where, when you're pulling together an event of this scale, one of the things we automatically look for on the product organization side is how can we find efficiencies? Where do we find ways to optimize all aspects of this? When you think about a 14-hour time difference between Pyeongchang and DC, one of the things we had to factor is who was going to turn on feeds at 5 o'clock in the morning, or in particular, when you get an email from one of our videographers from the ski slope on, uh, at 5.30 in the morning about where is the video that they just thought was going to be featured, which happens, uh, one of the things you find out is like the complexity of layers here really is where you start to align on how do we then get complexity out of the system. One of the ways we do that is actually looking at templates that will help us recirculate the content and also how we can then make sure that the content flowing through the templates is being directed through intelligent means. So with that in mind, when we think about that, there's also the added piece of editorial standards, whether it's our own network original content, if it's third party content, if it's information that's coming from our users, how are we maximizing all of those experiences and driving both user value so they're always seeing something fresh and new from constantly changing and evolving events to also providing value for people who are trying to reach those viewers as advertisers. And so that's where I think part of what we came out with was by partnering with Iris on how we were going to surface video both at a USA Today level as well as in all of our local markets. We were leveraging how we were going to surface that video and recirculate it to users so they felt like they were always seeing something new in the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the most kind of important takeaway in this case for like a media company is kind of the, the leap that occurs when you move from, say, just doing manual playlists, right, or a simple kind of algorithm that will always show the users the same thing to something that's learning. Um, so... Uh, having that data and taking that away as an organization, whether it's for, you know, what content should we produce more of, which is a use case that we work on all the time with your teams, uh, and also actually being able to learn from all the users. So we see this a lot where there's uh, videos that are the best performing assets on a an, an, uh, client's website, especially in news, um, where then that video actually has very few initial clicks. Um, so it's something that's difficult to surface in the real estate of a web page, but if you're able to learn from that, then you can take advantage of it, program it to, say, a first-time user who's coming in, and actually help them you know, turn into a new and loyal audience. That's right. In particular, the screenshot you're seeing on this particular element, this was a brand new template that we were also creating as part of that effort. One, of, This was a, a video template. Our previous version of this within our desktop experience was basically a single hero video with an ad unit on the page, a very simplistic circa 2011 type of page template. In designing something that put more video above the fold that was being served through a dynamic module, we were really acknowledging that if you have reached this page as a user, 
your intentions are already to consume more Olympic video or would be more likely to consume it if it was presented to you in a way that was easily accessible. And so not only just providing continuous play, but providing more of that visual prompt in this space was intended to leverage what we were also then implementing through the player with Iris. Beyond that, one of the other things we were able to do using the, the lock-off capabilities was actually be able to really super serve some of our advertiser clients. So beyond um, the day-to-day the -day of trying to make programmatic run through the system, this was actually a unique case at this level where we actually had high-level direct sold campaigns and were really able to provide a lot of value from that side of the operation as well. So when we had our farmer's insurance campaign, one of the unique aspects of this was the spot that was put on the front of these pre-rolls was six seconds, as opposed to a normal 15 second spot in the eternity of waiting to skip ad from a user experience, knowing it was so mildly disruptive and knowing that it was actually going to be flighted through all of this highly promoted content, we actually ended up with a very happy scenario of actually needing to throttle that campaign and make sure we didn't deliver too early in the game's cycle. So we really saw a lot of value in being able to create prominence, create capture and a qualified audience, and then be able to be very mindful about making it persistent across the course of the event that we were providing coverage on. And then when we looked at the results out of this, one of the re there were a lot of things that made the Winter Olympics Games a win for us in terms of our blended approach. But when we saw 50% video lift, uh, that was a clear, video was one of the key aspects of this event that's shown out of what we had created. And then the, the increase in user in-stream retention versus regular content, I think also speaks to this being a unique event where we know that people, if you can bring them in a little bit, but provide more opportunities to consume, they will come with you and return with you. And I think one of the things that we also saw that was great about this was our expectations were modest in comparison to, say, the Rio Summer Games, where you see a lot of people having more appetite, and especially in Rio, where your, your time, zone, time zone challenges are, are less pronounced. Um, we actually saw this Winter Games outpace Rio coverage on video several times throughout the cycle because of this type of presentation and concerted effort. So when we think about that, one of the ways that we looked at how do we reproduce this in the future, part of it is thinking about do we continue to iterate and do we have the right product templates and experiences that allow video to elevate, to really make it feel like it's the appropriate experience for a user, whether they're consuming it on their phone, on their smart TV, on their desktop. How do we make sure that editorial has the ability and has the resources either to create the most compelling original content or is partnering with the right outlets and that they are feeding through our distribution channels in a way that will make sure that we are surfacing those elements that get the benefit of being the most completed videos, the ones that have the most viewability, and the ones with the longest lifespan in terms of continuing coverage. Uh, our revenue teams also in the ability to prioritize content that they know will work for a specific audience. I think one of the key things here too is not to continue to be incessant in front of the user, but to be very smart about really cadencing out how we put that revenue in front of the user in a way that allows them to consume as much as they want without feeling like they are being tackled by the ad units in place. And so out of that, I think one of the things that we have been talking about with Field and the team with Iris is when we think about reproducing this, one of the next events that's gonna be coming up for us um, and in fact, for a lot of us here in the room, at least as individuals, is midterm elections. So the initial primaries um, in some states kick off today. Um, and I think one of the things that we look at as a unique opportunity, again, for us, is this is an event that plays almost on the flip side of the way that we approach the Olympics. By that I mean, this is obviously a very nationally relevant story, but it has deep roots at the local level. So how do we actually show that immediacy? How do we show the strength of our network where we have real embedded reporters who know these communities intimately, who know the politicians and the issues on the ground? And then how do we elevate those to universal issues and concerns no matter where someone lives at a national level? And one of the ways that we can do that and one of the ways that we're exploring is how do we actually do that through video then? Where we see those common interests, where we see 
the types of videos that people are using as we start to capture that metadata, how do we surface that from a local to national and then back again way so that we're constantly keeping that moving picture of this story as it unfolds over the next several months? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a great use case of how to deploy this technology in a really actionable way that really drives business results. The USA Today network having over 100 different properties, being able to now, you know, our goal is surface content, say, from Des Moines that's trending, and then actually bring it back to a national audience. So um, that's just another, you know, small example of things that we're trying to achieve. Um, and I think we're at our time. So um, I'll just close up and say that really there is a methodology for building large uh, businesses online. Um, there's been a lot of work done by YouTube, even with Content ID, and now Facebook has a new platform for detecting what content's there. So if you're an intellectual property holder, if you can produce content, and it's great content like Gannett's, you can actually manage the windowing it, the distribution of it, and then utilize best practices, which is what companies like Facebook and YouTube do, to then drive you know, great results in terms of a good user experience, and then leveraging the data to inform how you kind of uh, proceed and build the business. So that's it. If there's any questions, we can maybe take one or two, uh, and then we'll hand off the mic. It's editorial picking the videos. It's really more a case then of, at that point, the advertiser and the ad operations team have already so selected, I would say, the campaign. They're not picking the ind individual videos, but we're looking at an event like the Olympics, and we're saying we see a concerted effort to reach an audience, as well as within the coverage of that event then, where can we put those ad units so that they will reach the right and the most capacity eyeballs at that time. Yes. We still believe in separation of church and state. <laughs> That's an interesting example, given that we have Animal Kind, a pet franchise made for people like you. Um, I think what he's saying is yeah. Democrats and Republicans. Yes. Is that what it is? Well, um, I would say that's partly a content strategy consideration. I think it does get into when we understand user behavior and what people are consuming, as well as in a cats and dogs uh, metaphor, we always want to provide as a news outlet as balanced coverage as we can. And it's one of the things that is a point of pride for, for USA Today is that when you look on the spectrum, we are considered actually one of the better outlets at creating a balanced perspective. I would say one of the things though that is a constant challenge when we're serving information through AI is how are we continuing to add in the human editorial element? I think there are times when we want to make sure that we're always thinking about adding in that editorial expertise and perspective not just super serving. So it's, it is an art and a science from a journalism perspective. And I can speak from the machine learning perspective, right? With something like YouTube where the kind of system is pre-configured, really driven off of user behavior, you often end up at like the kind of the edge, right? Where then you're kind of drifting further and further down cat videos in this case. Uh, but when it's a controlled system, the term that we use is called drift, right? And you can turn it on or off and then it'll surface editorial content. So then it comes down to your tagging strategy as well as just like what's trending. But as long as you're producing content that has you know, coverage of da cats and dogs, then you're going to see kind of um, both of those topics emerge, but you can't control it. Thank you. Thank you very much.